It's wonderful to see so many people here interested to uh, hear about uh, dance and our work on uh, dance. I'm very much a newcomer to uh, studying dance. So what I'm going to tell you about today is one experiment that we've done in my group. And this experiment was run by Ilka Isik, a student working with me. She should really be the one up here giving this talk. Um, but uh, you know, I, uh, I'll hopefully be able to do uh, justice to the work that she uh, did. Um, and I'm also going to give you a little bit of background on what uh, I do and what I'm interested in and why I've come to dance as a uh, art form that I want to study. <clears throat> okay, so uh, my interests are really focused on understanding visual aesthetic experiences. So uh, people go to museums and we uh, have all kinds of experiences with artwork or with sculpture or with uh, buildings uh, that can move us greatly. Uh, in addition, we can have strong aesthetic experiences uh, to non-art objects like faces or landscapes or even ideas. Uh, and I'm interested in understanding what the psychological and neural processes are that support these experiences we have, particularly, particularly when they do really touch us deeply or move us or make us change our worldview or even just uh, uh, give us a sense of pleasure or make us laugh. Uh, so uh, just a, a brief de definition. Um, I have been working on trying to come up with my own definition of an aesthetic experience. And so currently, my definition is a, that it is a perceptual experience. So it involves seeing or hearing or feeling some kind of perception. Uh, and it is evaluative. Uh, it's affectively absorbing. Uh, and it engages sense-making or meaning processes. Um, and this may include a conceptual component. And indeed, much art uh, is highly conceptual and, and focuses uh, in some ways more on the conceptual than on the perceptual per se. In, in addition, it's linked to feelings of pleasure or beauty, uh, to being moved, which I'll talk about in a, in a bit, uh, as well as feelings of the awe or uh, feelings of awe or the sublime. And we also can uh, link these to judgments of liking or attractiveness. So I'm sure that there are many things you could find wrong with this uh, definition. It's kind of a, an, eff, uh, 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 an exercise in putting yourself out there to formulate a definition because then everyone wants to beat it up. So I'm happy for you to do so. Um, so one thing that we really look at a lot in our group is whether or not different people like the same things. So we do this by measuring shared taste. So we'll take a group of people and we're going to show them a bunch of images, and we're going to ask them which ones they like more, or which ones they find more beautiful, or which ones they find more moving. And we're going to see if everyone agrees. Does everyone like the same image, or does, do people have highly unique tastes? So one possible outcome is that everyone will agree that there's one common uh, denominator, and kind of everyone really likes the same thing. Another possibility is that everyone is completely unique, that there's no way that I can take one person's data and predict another person's responses. And then, of course, you could find something in between. Uh, one example of that is you might find clusters, that perhaps if I know something about you, if I know something about your past history, uh, if I know something about your level of exposure to the stimulus class, that I can maybe predict that you're going to like these types of stimuli, whereas a different group of people are maybe going to like these types of stimuli. So um, one experiment that we uh, <clears throat> did using this method a while ago, I'll uh, kind of walk you through as an example. Uh, in this experiment, so we're measuring shared taste, and we're showing people images of real-world scenes, so gardens and parking lots and farms. Uh, and the question we were interested in is understanding whether or not people's preferences for these types of images uh, are driven by features of the stimulus. So, you know, is it the case that everyone's going to like this one over here because, in general, people like green and people like certain types of features? And people over here, they, they don't like uh, gray and they don't like straight lines. So can I really, can I, uh, for example, use a computer to look at these images and based upon the image alone, predict which image people are going to like? So that would mean that uh, these kind of external objective features are determining preferences. On the other hand, you might imagine that people's preferences for these types of images are instead driven by internal subjective factors, like whether or not you yourself have seen it, or what types of associations you have with these types of images. So I might have positive associations with the garden or negative associations with the parking lot. So uh, without going through the details, what we did is we took observers and we showed them these types of images. We also showed them images that have a lot of visual variation, but that don't have any meaning to them, really. They don't have shared semantic interpretations. So here, you could turn to your neighbor and describe this image very well. You would have a very hard time describing this image to your neighbor in a way that they would know what you're talking about. So there's no shared semantic information across these. And when we look at uh, 
agreement in people's preferences for these two types of images, they really point to the fact that internal subjective factors are driving people's preferences. So if two people have a more similar meaning for an image, then they're more likely to have a more similar preference. Uh, if you find something to be personally relevant to you, to what you do, uh, perhaps that really uh, uh, drives uh, your subjective sense of, of which images you find aesthetically appealing. Um, okay, now, I want to mention this, this thing that's come up several times, this, this idea of, of uh, moving beyond the concept of beauty. And this is definitely something that we've tried to embrace in our research. So rather than asking people, which image do you find beautiful, um, we want to acknowledge the fact that people can find an experience or an artwork appealing for reasons other than beauty, because perhaps it's challenging and they want to be intellectually challenged. Or perhaps they are looking for things which are emotionally evocative, or things which really evoke wonder. Wow, that's amazing, I've never heard of that before. Uh, and beauty sometimes doesn't capture these types of experiences. So we've been using the phrase being moved. Uh, it's perhaps not perfect, but it's one way of trying to capture the larger variation in ways that people uh, might be aesthetically engaged or aesthetically touched by a artistic or non-artistic experience. So another study where we've used this uh, method of shared taste is one where we ask people uh, to tell us which of these images move you. And we showed people a variety of different image types. So we showed people faces and natural landscapes, architecture, and artwork. And what we find here when we measure shared taste is that there's a very high degree of shared taste. So this is in this pie, how much of, how much of the variance of people's responses can I explain using a shared factor in the dark color versus how much can I explain using an individual factor in the light color. And so when we ask people to make judgments of faces, we find that there's a strong sh sense of shared taste. One person's preferences can predict another person's very well. We also find that this is true to a lesser degree for natural landscapes, but there's also a healthy degree of shared taste. On the other hand, when we ask people to make judgments of artwork or of architecture, we find that people are incredibly idiosyncratic. They are self-consistent, but one person's preferences do not predict another person's. Uh, and so what we think uh, we've kind of proposed here is that there might be a distinction between natural kinds, things which occur in the real world, that somehow our experience over our lifetime with faces and landscapes leads different people to converge to a more similar mapping in how we go from a stimulus to then an emotional and aesthetic response. Whereas many of us have uh, different types of experience and, and oftentimes these, our judgments of artworks, for example, don't really matter for us on a daily life. For, you know, if, I, if I don't or do like a particular painting, it's not like I'm gonna you know, lose my job or have a bad uh, uh, social interaction necessarily because of it. And so perhaps this means that different people can maintain very idiosyncratic mappings in terms of how they judge these artifacts of human culture. Okay, another question that we uh, look at a lot in my lab <clears throat> is whether, excuse me, how the brain supports aesthetic experiences. So a technique that we use is called functional magnetic resonance imaging. So we put someone on this little table and slide them into this machine. And we uh, use this machine to measure a correlate of neural activity. And from that, we can try to understand which parts of the brain are modulated by a task. So for example, what parts of the brain show more or less activation when you look at an image? What parts of the brain show more or less activation when you are shown something that you find aesthetically appealing? Um, and so uh, we will put people in a scanner and we'll show them artwork. So this is uh, an example, some, some samples of artworks that we've used. <clears throat> and the goal here is really, uh, again, to give something for everyone. So we know that different people might like different things. Hopefully in our large set of artwork, which is larger than just what's on the screen here, there's something that you really like and maybe something else that you really like and something else that you really like, such that for each individual person, we at least get some trials where they go, oh wow, that's really cool, I like that. Uh, and then we can combine those together to try to get an image of what uh, parts of the brain are modulated by aesthetic appeal. And I'm not going to go into the uh, weeds of the data analysis, but suffice it to say that we find that the visual system is active, no surprise. When I show you an image, the visual system is active. And so this is a part of the brain that is uh, engaged when you are focused externally, when you are looking at, uh, uh, when, when there's light coming into your eyeballs and you're analyzing it. Surprisingly, we also find a different network, a network called the default mode network is also engaged. And this network is actually more engaged in internal focus or thinking. So it's not responding to the external world, it's actually more internally oriented. And so we find that uh, kind of surprisingly, both this external system and also this internal system seem to be engaged when a person finds an artwork to be highly aesthetically moving. 
So a big thing that we're now trying to figure out as we move forward is how these different networks talk to each other. How is it that this externally focused network and this internally focused network talk to each other when a person has a, a moving experience while they're watching a movie or when they look at a painting? And so in order to study how brain systems interact, we really need a dynamic picture. So now hopefully I can motivate why we care about dance to you. So we started our research project by kind of taking snapshots of the brain. We would show people static images, and we would ask them how moving is this image, and then we would kind of take a Polaroid, our, our, our fMRI camera, use it like a Polaroid, and take a snapshot of the brain. Okay, so we have a static picture of a static artistic experience. Now, what we do is we want to add in time. So I'm not going to talk about this experiment, but we have another experiment where the stimulus is still static. It's still an artwork that doesn't change. But now we're going to ask people to report their aesthetic experience using a continuous dial. So it may be the case that at first you look at one corner of a piece of art, and then you look down at another corner, and your experience changes over time. So we want to be able to track that, the fact that an experience itself is dynamic. And then we're also going to put aside our Polaroid camera and pick up a movie camera, and we're going to try to take more than one image of this experience so that we can track the dynamic changing of the brain patterns as you look at a piece of artwork. Okay, so we've gone from a static snapshot, now we're trying to add time in our measurements, and now the third, uh, excuse me, the second step is that we now want to set the world in motion. So now we want to put the stimulus in motion, and again, we want to add in dynamic measures of people's responses as well as measure dynamic responses in the neural uh, uh, signatures. So um, we could have chosen a number of different stimulus sets to do this, so why dance? Well, first of all, it has a heavy visual component. Uh, second, it's clearly dynamic. Uh, dance really requires dynamics. Third, uh, and this may not be, it, this is a bit of an esoteric point, we like dance because people's experience with dance as an audience member is mediated through watching bodies. And one cool thing about that is that we know where in the brain bodies are processed and analyzed visually. So we can isolate those parts of the brain and we can study those. And we can study those separately from other parts of the brain that analyze the shape of a scene or that analyze objects. So we, we know that by using a stimulus driven by bodies, we can track some of the perceptual response in the brain while a person is watching dance. And for example, much of the work that um, uh, Beatrice told you about has been key in establishing the brain regions that one would look at if we want to track uh, the, uh, a audience member's uh, neural processes as they watch a moving body. Dance is emotional, uh, and uh, also it's quite varied. There's a, a lot of different types of dance, and so we can get a lot of variance in terms of hopefully, again, finding something that everyone likes. So for, me, for some of you, maybe classical ballet is, is going to tickle your fancy, but for others, that's just not going to cut it. You're going to really want something that's a bit grittier or a bit more modern or you know, perhaps even ugly. Um, and, of course, it's interesting, and it's interesting to me. I like dance, I like to dance, I like to watch dance. Um, so the study uh, that we did um, was, as I mentioned, run by um, Ilkay Izik, uh, where we wanted to assess dynamics using video. So in this experiment, you are um, uh, watching a video, in this case a landscape, and you're making this continuous judgment using a dial. So people were asked, how, basically, how much are you enjoying the clip at each moment? And then when the clip is over, uh, you make another judgment. You tell us how intense was your experience overall. So we have a, a curve that expresses what parts of the video you like, and then we have an overall assessment of, oh, I, I really like this video, or I didn't like that video. And we're going to do this both with dance clips and also with landscape clips. Um, so the dance clips are 30 seconds, they're high quality video. We just took random, randomly from the internet, you know, which apparently you're not supposed to do. Um, uh, and <laughs> we picked clips that uh, really focus on dance. I, 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 they're not random, but uh, they are from the internet. Um, but we picked clips that really focus on dancers, so there's no props, it's not driven by the background, so that hopefully the response people are having is really driven by, mediated by bodies. Uh, and we've taken away the music, so we wanted to pick clips that would be enjoyable or kind of understandable without music. Uh, the variety of styles we have uh, that's mostly modern, but there's also some ballet. There's one to many dancers, and there's variety in the speed of movement. So here's just an example, and I'll let this one uh, play all the way through.
Okay, so that's one of our stimuli, and I just want to make sure I actually credit the uh, people who uh, are uh, doing this. And then uh, just to give you a bit of a sense, here are a selection of some of the other stimuli, and I'm just going to kind of set them all in motion on the screen, and I don't think my computer actually has enough CPU power to render them all well running at the same time, but the point here is really just to give you a little bit of a sense of some of the variability in the types of clips we're using. So there's um, uh, larger groups, smaller groups, uh, uh, you know, a, different, a variety of different styles. Let's see, did they all start yet? No, okay. But all right, so you at least get a little bit of a sense of some of the variability here in jerky motion, unfortunately. OK. <laughs> exactly. They are not actually that jerky in reality. OK, so here I'm going to show you a little bit of data from this experiment. And so as a, uh, as a reminder, this is just behavioral data. We're not measuring anything from the brain here. Um, so first of all, what I'm showing here is the response of one person to many different clips. So we have the dance clips and the landscape clips. And what you can see is that this particular person, they you know, kind of really liked some clips and they didn't like others. There are also certain clips where they kind of had a peak perhaps at some point. Uh, this person had kind of like a downward peak here. Uh, so there's some variability in terms of the, the individ one person's response to many different clips. More interestingly is that if you take the same clip and you look at the responses of different people, you can see that not everyone is doing the same thing, right? So some people are actually going down and not liking this clip at all. Other people are going up. Some people are just kind of monotonically going up here and staying up. Others kind of go up and then come down again. So again, there's a lot of variability, even with uh, different people looking at the exact same state. Stimulus. And I think this was actually a little bit surprising, and in fact, that's really going to be the main takeaway that I have for you today. Um, so we now try to quantify this in various ways. So one, things we do, one thing we do is we basically ask, how much are people turning the dial? Are you just kind of slowly turning the dial like this, or are you kind of wildly turning the dial up and down, really responding to individual moments uh, in different clips? So we quantify this here. Um, and then what we do is we look at how much each movie or each subject differs from the average amount. And what we find is that it is the case that there are some movies where people turn the dial more, and there are some movies where people turn the dial less, but a much bigger explanatory variable is people. Some people turn the dial a whole lot, and some people don't really move the dial at all. And so we find that the amount of temporal variability is much more a property of participants than it is of movies. Um, to the point that we can even classify some people as kind of like fast responders that really seem to be paying attention all the time to the moment-to-moment -moment details. Another thing we can do is we can, um, again, measure shared taste. Do different people like the same thing? And so we can quantify this for the dance, uh, dance people. So here's the average and here's each individual person. And you can see that there are some people who really don't agree with other people. Uh, on, uh, we kind of get this middle to low degree of agreement, both for dance and landscape stimuli. Um, we do a retest, which I won't tell you about here. When we compare this to the data I showed you earlier, I'm using a different uh, data type plot, but basically we can see that these dance and landscape videos, so we're, we're showing people bodies and landscapes, but by rendering them as kind of artistic movies, now we're bringing down the agreement where they're almost being treated more like art, okay? That's our interpretation here. Now, interestingly, when we look at the agreement across people for the continuous rating, so this moment-to-moment -moment changes, we find that there's even less agreement. So people actually really don't agree even on what are the coolest moments in these individual videos. So as you were watching the video, you might have had a favorite moment. Well, surprise, surprise, the person next to you might have had a different favorite moment, okay? Uh, so moment-to-moment -moment ratings of dance are much more idiosyncratic. So my take-home lesson message here basically is that viewer experiences are highly personal, even for dance, a highly choreographed art form. So you might think that given how much choreography goes into controlling the stimulus, that there would be very tight responses to particular movements or particular moments, and we're not seeing that. Okay, this may not be a surprise to those of you who are dancers. So I want to now just pose some big questions that I think I'm personally interested in and I think this field could look at uh, in terms of dance specifically. So first of all, I'm really interested in understanding dance uh, as, and how it, you can think about it as the communication channel of meaning and emotion. So from what the choreographer plans, then through what the dancers execute, and to then what the audience actually gets out of the experience. And of course, there might also be some feedback in the other direction that would be interesting to study as well. 
Um, I think the question of coordination and also therefore brain synchrony is also interesting. So coordination between dancers. Uh, are dancers' brains syncing to each other when they are uh, doing a dance? Is there synchrony and coordination between dancers and audience? And actually there's been some good work by a colleague of ours, Guido Orgs, looking at some of these questions recently. And also potentially between audience members. Do audience members' brains uh, march in synchrony when they're watching a dance? Uh, I'm also, of course, interested in the role of narrative structure. What happens when you take narrative structure out of dance? Uh, it, it, is narrative structure one of the things that would drive more agreement if it were present? Uh, and then, of course, are there differences between live and pre-recorded performances? So what really is the extra oomph you get when you're uh, part of a live, watching a live performance? So with that, I'll, I'll stop. I think I've gone a little bit over and, and thank um, my uh, collaborators. Thank you.